Okay, folks, uh, we got a different situation here. I want to show you, since we've been working horses in the western bit, I earlier I used the buckskin horse to, to show how I get a horse to turn around with a western bit in their mouth. In other words, these are horses that have been rode a really long ways. This horse is what my friend Bob Snyder in Wyoming would have called a stargazer. He carries his head up. The buckskin horse already had collection put on him and was light. This horse isn't that way. He's gonna be, but he's not. So I've got to get collection before I can get the turnaround. It was already there on the buckskin. Bernard put it on there. So once again, I'm just gonna walk in circles and then show you how it works, how I do it. You notice that's the way he naturally wants to carry himself. Now there's nothing wrong with this head carriage outside making a circle. But the problem is whenever you ask him for something, which I'll do on the way back, you'll see how it, he's hollow, hollow in the back. So now if I want to stop him, the head goes up, breaks at the withers and the pole. If I want to turn him, he automatically goes out to it, all right? There's two ways to get it, or three, four, I don't know. This particular horse, the way he's made, I'm gonna show you typically what I would do, and then I'll show you what I'm gonna do on this horse. Slacken the rein, now, contact. Automatic pushes, it's automatic. Watch my left hand, more contact. Feet move, head makes it. Horse pushes. I'm not asking anything with my legs. That's with his feet not moving. So if I wanted to use him for a clock commercial, it'd be fine, but I really need him to actually walk. Right now he's pushing pretty hard on my hand. You can see that. That's why I do what I'm about to do. So what I'll do is I'll get him moving, which is a natural gait forward on this horse today. And then I'm going to shorten my rein and slide it down his neck. The math works out that if I can have this angle steady, I can have a release up the neck. If I hold my hand up here, I can't control things as accurate. That's why my hand's on the mane. You'll also just watch how this, the mechanics work. So I'm going to start walking and set it up as I come toward you. This is the horse walking. I'm shortening up my reins. That's how short they are. Now I'm going to put my hand on the neck and slide down to the withers and keep the horse walking. I'm not trying to guide him anywhere, but I'm in a round pen, so I ain't too worried. Now, what I'm doing right now has very little impact on this horse. So now, right there is where my hand is. See how you can make it standing still? The reins go shorter yet. And by the way, if you need to, just tie a knot in your reins. Once again, this is why I, I use Ramal reins on a spade bit horse. I use Ramal reins on a half breed horse that has been trained accordingly. This horse has never seen a Ramal rein. Short rein, neck. Forward first and then slide down the neck. Now watch him. I'm just gonna keep his feet going with my feet. All they have to do is keep walking. Now my hand, if you'll notice, is four inches higher than it was. Now the horse has the reins short enough to know the angle and he'll bridle up and to stop, I just simply quit riding. I exhale and sit down. Please note the distance. This is the math that worked on this horse today. Now, if you think I'm pulling on him, you're wrong. If you work with me on this, you're gonna find out that he is pushing. I am not pulling. 
If I need forward movement, I just simply put my hand up the neck. When I go to the mark, which is here, I don't pull. He's pushing on my hand. It's up to him to back off. Once again, never, ever, ever will you see me do this on a cold. Never. Forward. Right leg. I'm starting to set up a foundation for the turn. Sliding. My feet have to keep the horse walking. He would like to stop, but I'm tapping him just to keep his feet moving so he can work this out. This particular exercise, I'm just setting up the boundary and he's going to find the right spot. Now, if you tie their head back and go to the house, you have just failed because it will go the opposite way. Because when he makes it, I am able to release. If he's bitted up like a level seven whatever, it won't work. There. Now I need to listen for the cricket. And if I can hear the cricket, it'll tell me that he's made it. Now on that subject, this is a given now. There, there's the cricket. I'm going to release everything so he can sort it out. He goes back to his old position because that's a habit. And they're not born this way, folks. He's that way because he's been defending his mouth. And they learn to get the perfect angle with their head so that the reins are pushing against their molars and it blocks them from smashing the tongue. That's why they do that. But what I want to tell you, if you'll watch my right foot, there was a question asked about spurs, not knowing how to use them. Okay, you can see my spur on my boot. People that I work with, as things get faster, they get behind themselves. They tend to put their toes down and their heels up. Then they try to spur, which means they're spurring the back cinch. Now this phenomenon, I have no idea what it's about because it's going to hurt eventually. So riding like this with your spurs is not correct. Now, people that grew up riding English learn how to polish the inside of their boot. So this is how they spur. They rub the horse, which has nothing to do with pressure and release. They're just polishing their boot. I turn my toe out, and the goal is I use the end of my spur. The goal is to roll my calf and not use my spur. The spur is a tool, the calf is a signal. And I am telling the horse, here it comes. Now I can contact the horse with my spur if need be. But if you don't have your toe out, unless you wear bull riding spurs, it isn't gonna happen. So be aware. But here's the biggest problem I see, believe it or not. Feet behind, toes down. In some circles, that's known as a butt dart because you will have your head stuck in the ground. It's just a matter of time. I'm going to work this horse and go up and down the neck now that he's had time to contemplate his life. And I will show you how this works. I will not make my horse walk with full contact. That would be betrayal. Leave. Toe out. Right spur. Now please remember, when I first started, I told you he's not going anywhere because he's in a round curl. What you need to know is I'm setting him up for the next stage. stage. Now I'm going to go ahead and bring the bridle in. Here it comes too long. There it is. Now it's up to him. Now my left leg is off and my right foot is on. He's used to walking in a circle, so I'm using that to my advantage. Look at my right toe. As soon as he yields his left front foot, I release. I'm going to ask him to turn left. Please note where my left hand is. 
So the moral of this story, please remember, you don't neck rein horses. You ride horses off your skeleton. Now when he stops, he feels comfortable enough to bridle up and roll the cricket. Walking, he doesn't feel that comfortable. This is the point of the story when you cannot train a horse, but you can outlast him. I did not release this time. We're moving on. Up the neck, watch my calf. Didn't make it, here comes the spur. That's why you ride a spur. Hand position correct. Horse needs to bridle up. Looking where I'm going now, raising the bar. <sighs> Quit riding, wait for the cricket, release the reins. You have now clocked out. Please lower your skull and relax. Thank you so much. Okay. Please don't forget that when you're outside making a circle, this is not how you ride if you want to get there today. Western riders throw the reins at them so they can get out and travel with their natural stride and make long distances. This is for lateral work in a disciplined ride, as in working cattle in a corral situation. That's what I'm trying to do is to get this horse to gather up, raise his back and get some level of collection because if I don't, in the corral, all it is gonna be is a head slinging contest. I don't want his head slinging. That's not how this is done. The test, I'm going to set my reins, slide down the neck and if he loads up on the hindquarter, I got him. If he pushes on my hand and doesn't load up on the hind quarter, he's not there yet. Here's the math. Right there, here's the slide. See, he hasn't, sh he hasn't shifted his weight. He hasn't made it yet, that's what he's telling me. I'm going to add more and ask and show him, see, see his brain? This is literally connecting that to the feet. Shorten, slide. This is why you know the horse is still flat. He may give me a skull and he may roll the cricket, but he's not there. It's nothing personal, it's just that he's not there. He hasn't made the connection yet. So I will show him, watch my hand. Remember this four inch space. If I do this all the time, I will over bridle him. All I want him to do is shift his weight back. What are your options? These are when a horse tests the water. See how the skull turns and the nose goes up? He's finding out, how can I get away from this pressure? Well, the way to get away from it is to load up backwards. Don't push on it. I will increase the pressure. This is the moment. This is just part of the deal. It's helping to connect the dots. That's it. Okay, now what you've watched me do is contradict myself. I've walked forward, slid my hand. Now I felt inside that I needed to get him to connect to his feet standing still, which he did. So stick with me. Now I'm going to leave again. When you work with horses, you have to be true to yourself. In other words, search your own brain and say, what do I need to do to get across to this horse what I want? Okay, I need to do this and this to leave. I know that. He knows that. Same circle I made before. Now I'm going to grab the saddle horn just for balance and I'm going to turn my shoulder more and the horse turns tighter. Now I'm going to go the other way 
just because I have to go back to the old style, brand new world, different eye, different brain, different everything. Sliding, shortness, there. Looking, left spur on, right shoulder open, looking, setting up a foundation. There's absolutely no, there, he just made it. Stopping, cricket, and leaving. Looking. Please understand, part of the moral of this story is you don't need to do all this stuff. Sliding the hand, spurs, stay walking in collection, left spur only, makes for a right hand turn. He either hits the fence or turns right. Now, just to add a little mystique to this deal, if you want, you can breathe the horse into the cricket. You have nothing else to do. So try it. I'm going to try it right over here. I'm as high as I can get on my seat bones. Now I'm going to exhale. I slowed the horse down by exhaling. There's the cricket. He just made it with the cricket. So, can a horse 10 years old listen to your skeleton after being ridden 1,753 miles incorrectly? Yes, it can. This, my friends, some people have a horse and then it dies and then they get a horse. Okay, if you got two 30 year old horses in your lifetime and you started when you were 10, you're done, you're about to die. But if you've had a whole bunch of horses, what I'm doing is offering you an option of reading the horse and understanding the buckskin didn't need it. This horse can't do my lateral work unless it has it. That's why I showed this video today. And I think after seeing the other one matching to this one, you can get the correlation. Now, before I go, I'd like to explain to you what I've learned about Hawaii, or Hawaii as I call it. The original beef were brought there by a ship's captain. Vancouver was his name, but he in fact did not come from Vancouver. Nobody's ever seen to pin that down, but my guess is Monterey, I don't know, doesn't matter. The reason they dropped off animals, which were cloven hoofed incidentally, pig, sheep, goat, cow, is because the location of Hawaii was so far out in the ocean, they wanted a place to be able to resupply their ships with some kind of protein. So they dropped this meat animals off on a lush island and figured we can always come back here through the years and there'll be salted meat we can take with us to finish our voyage. That was the reason for it. I want to share the differences. The reason cattle ended up in Florida was because the Spanish left without their animals. They didn't come there to restore their ships. They didn't think about that. They came there to torture the natives and turn them into whatever. Didn't work, so they left. California, the mission system set up the beef and livestock trade and the missions made the hide and tallow work. And then it turned into the ranchos. So there's three different reasons why meat showed up in these Spanish influenced islands. I use the word Spanish because down the road Hawaii got in on the picture because of the paniolo, which at that time was the Española. The Española, as far as I'm concerned, after all this reading came from California he, in fact, was a Spaniard because he was in California before Mexico seceded, which meant he was not a Mexican. He was a Spaniard. That's why Española means Sp Spanish. Anyway, the point I want to tell you is that in Hawaii, the king put a law out that you couldn't kill beef for 10 years. All right, He knew he would get the numbers. He never dreamed it'd be the numbers they ended up with, which was a lot. Okay. He contracted a man that was a bullock hunter 
and he went up and killed cattle. Then the Hawaiians, natives, who were the indigenous people, watched this happen. They learned the skills and the trade, and they, in fact, ran their own cattle, beef, and tallow business and salted meat for years before it was taken over as a state of the United States. So what I'm trying to get at is that the Hawaiian people themselves were in business with the king and they had the cattle business going. In the book it mentioned they were the only ones that ever did that. Well, I, I gotta say that in Florida, when the Spanish left, the Seminole got in the cattle business. The pioneers never came until the ones that didn't want anything to do with the Civil War and or post-Civil War. So the Seminoles were in the cattle business who were the natives for a really long time. California, the natives were never in the cattle business unless it was on a full moon. It was all dictated by the mission and then the rancho. So that's the three differences between the cattle business in the three places. And um, stay tuned. So... Any questions, feel free to email, but this is a work in progress, what you're looking at. And the object is to teach a horse something and have them not bothered. That's the object of this. If they're dripping, sweat, and heaving, and so are you, then you probably need to do something different. Thank you. Goodbye.